Hello, everyone. It's uh, Thursday, December the 21st. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, we've got a long list of stuff, but we'll move through it and move through it as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, this is some tough stuff right here. But we had, uh, very tragically, we had a couple of troopers that were shot. Uh, the suspect was also shot and lost his life. One of our troopers has lost a leg from his uh, knee down. Uh, you know, these folks every single day, every single day do so much goodness. It's all, it's, it's just unbelievable. And for all of them, you know, for our Colonel Chambers, uh, everyone, all the way down, I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me really loud and clear. All of us in West Virginia, all of us across this nation should never forget Absolutely, the very people that they call, we call first that come running to the fire are these folks. You know, Trooper Bean or Trooper Spessick, Spesser, Spesser. We call, you know, over something that is as simple as an arrest warrant for battery, you know, to be delivered to a house, to be given to, to an individual. And all of a sudden, what do they awaken to? They awaken to gunfire. One of them shot four times. Absolutely, it is tragic beyond all comparison. You know, thank God that they're going to be as okay as maybe they can be. You know, Trooper Bean is going to, it, it, is, is shot and, and is going to lose part of his leg. You know, it is, uh, it's just terrible. I mean, that's all there is to it. But at the same time, we're so blessed to have them. We're so blessed to have them. Sure, they screw up from time to time. For crying out loud, who doesn't screw up from time to time? Sure, it's absolutely maybe something that they should have never, ever, ever, ever done. But when you, when you stereotype, stereotype the whole group because of some really bad actors, I think that's not fair. I also want to take this time to thank the Virginia State Police. You know, the folks that are around in Fairfax County, they really stepped up and really helped out because Trooper Bean had to be transported to a hospital in Fairfax County. You know, I, I know from time to time, you know, I've, I've flown into D.C. and I've, I've been with these folks and everything, and it's unbelievable how good they are too. Please keep all these folks in your prayers. You know, these families and, and, uh, and what's happened here is really sad. Really, really sad. So, uh, I, you know, I pray that you'll pray for all of us in every way, especially these families of these two troopers. But, uh, but at, at this time of year especially, you know, I've... I, you know, I, I ask you to offer up your prayers for this person that's lost his life and surely was direct, uh, misdirected to be all, you know, off, the off the chart and their family. You know, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. These troopers' families have been impacted in, in such a way that is uh, off the chart. Please keep them in your prayers. We've got a COVID update, and I think uh, General Hoyer is going to, you know, talk to us about that. So, General, you're up. Governor, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you again and provide an update from our interagency task force as it relates to COVID, flu, and RSV. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, there is an uptake both in West Virginia and nationally in COVID flu and RSV cases. We're also seeing both nationally and in West Virginia an increase in the number of hospitalizations uh, in all three of those cases. Uh, most of the time, we again are uh, focused on protecting people over the age of 65, but the best way for us to protect each other during this holiday season is for all of us to stay updated on our current immunizations, and again, particularly focusing on flu, COVID, and RSV. 
Uh, it's about not just protecting yourself, but protecting children and grandparents and all the loved ones you may be around during the holiday season. Uh, my wife and I are updated on all of our immunizations because we now have a daughter-in-law who is expecting and we want to be able to protect both her and our future grandchild. So again, if you have questions or concerns or want to understand more about uh, what immunizations are available and what you should be uh, taking in the way of immunizations, uh, you can reach out through vaccinate.wv.gov. Also, uh, DHHR has begun transitioning the COVID-19 vaccine information line to an all immunization hotline. So questions can be uh, answered related to all of those COVID, flu, and RSV, and other immunization questions that you might have. Uh, that immunization hotline number is 1-800-642-3634. Again, 1-800-642-3634. Encourage all West Virginians to get updated on their immunizations, and I hope that Governor, you and your family uh, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday, and wish Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday to all West Virginians. Uh, God bless the great state of West Virginia. Well, General, thank you so much, and uh, boy, I think back of all the days all the days through all the stuff through COVID that we went through and all the decisions that had to be made and all of your assistance and input and everything, I'll, I'll never forget it. It was so meaningful and absolutely you're a leader beyond leaders. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Congratulations on that little one that's on the way and Merry Christmas to you and all your family in every way. And thank you again for all that you've done. Uh, we just had a deployment of folks in the National Guard that are coming home and they're home now and everything. They just landed uh, in Texas and uh, they, they were on a deployment for 10 months overseas and, uh, and, and what an incredible uh, gr group of uh, men and women and the great work that they did and everything. And uh, they were providing support to the U.S. Army Central Area Support Group in Jordan and uh, so we welcome them back and uh, very, very proud, very, very proud. You know, they're, they're part of our uh, 156 military police law and order detachment. So great, great work and uh, we're glad to have you home. Okay, we've got uh, a special announcement by a friend, uh, but more Capito, our judiciary chair of the House of Delegates is with us now. So. You know, more if you'd, uh, if you'd like, go ahead, and, uh, but uh, you're a great friend. Thank you. Well, thank you, Governor, and uh, I echo what everybody said. You know, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody in the great state of, uh, of West Virginia, and congratulations to you, Governor, for uh, ending this year, 2023, in a better place uh, than we started it. You know, it is an honor uh, to serve in the House of Delegates and I have been honored by the people of the 55th to represent them for seven years. And I'm eternally grateful for the trust that they placed in me. You know, I was uh, first elected back in 2016 alongside two other get it done conservatives, Governor, you being one of them, and uh, of course Donald Trump being the other. And boy, have we gotten things done for the state of West Virginia. We've built roads and cut taxes in West Virginia and we've created so many jobs and I will tell you as I travel around the state of West Virginia what I'm hearing all across the state is that the people want more of what we have been getting more of the policies that have put us on a path to prosperity and to build on that progress and that's exactly why I am running for governor to continue uh, the momentum governor that you have created and so I think that the right thing to do and I have informed the speaker of the same is that I will step aside from my role in the House of Delegates so that I can focus my full attention to the people of West Virginia 
to continue to listen to them, to sit with them at their tables and engage in the dialogue and the issues that are important to them so that I can effectively and responsibly lead as governor. I thank you for your time. I wish you Merry Christmas. God bless West Virginia. Well, Maura, thank you, and thank you for your service. Thank you for your service as our Judiciary Chair in, in, in the House of Delegates, and, uh, and we wish you well but in, in every way. And Merry Christmas to you and all your family. And, uh, but again, thank you so much for, for the years of incredible service and uh, to, the, to the House of Delegates as our ju Judiciary Chair. We have a flag lowering, you know, for a, for a delegate, you know, in, in the past, you know, uh, Larry Faircloth and everything, and, uh, and Larry was from Berkeley County, and, and uh, we lost Larry, uh, you know, but on December the 23rd, we will be lowering our flags to half staff at the Capitol and, and in Berkeley County to honor the life of this incredible man and everything. I don't think I knew Larry, knew Larry well, but at the same time, I surely knew of him and, uh, and, and what a name in that area and how, how well received and well recognized he and his family are and everything. And so Kathy and I will surely keep all you folks in our prayers. Uh, you know, I, I really, I'm a real believer that, uh, that our state employees do a good job. And, uh, you know, in, in all fairness, we have, we have, we have honestly shepherded our ways through COVID. We have, we have produced unbelievable surpluses at a time when a state was really on the ropes. And uh, all of this is done by a lot, a lot, a lot of people that are pulling the, pulling the rope together. And so uh, we want to try to reward as best we possibly can. And, 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 you know, give them, you know, opportunities to be with their families. So we're going to, we're going to take uh, this coming Friday, you know, or this, you know, Friday, I guess it's with day after tomorrow, or, or really I, tomorrow, I'm sorry, but uh, tomorrow and, uh, and to where they can have, you know, that as a full day state holiday. And we're going to do the same thing on December the 29th, you know, right before New Year's you know, as a full day state holiday. So to our state employees, enjoy yourselves and be with your families. It's a special time of year in my book. Uh, nothing, nothing could be more, nor, more of a better time of year than Christmas. And so take the time and be with your families. Our, our transportation secretary, you know, is with us now and everything uh, and is joining us today to give us an update on a couple of bridges in the northern panhandle. And, uh, I guess, Jimmy, you can go, and then I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the rear on the Water Development Authority grants and stuff. Well, thank you, Governor, and uh, th thank you for the opportunity to join your briefing today. So I, I think this is a really good, efficient way for us to get, uh, get some information up to the folks in the panhandle about some of their bridges. We're, uh, I, I, I'll start off with telling you, you know, your, your DOT bridge inspection program is the best in the country, and that, that's not uh, speculation. That, that's just the facts. The bridge inspection program was born out of tragedy right here in West Virginia uh, many years ago with the, with the collapse of the Point Pleasant Bridge just about this time of the year. But our bridge inspection folks go above and beyond to take care of more than 7,000 bridges in West Virginia, and we, we ensure that they are safe. If a, bridge is, uh, if a bridge is not safe, that bridge is not open. If a bridge is, uh, needs a, a restriction, then it has it. Uh, the root of the problem with the bridges in West Virginia, of course, is the decades and decades of underinvestment that we've made in our bridges and in our, in our roadways over decades and decades. It's just a simple matter of underinvesting in our infrastructure. That's why we desperately needed the Roads to Prosperity program to turn that around. That's it. That, and, and turn it around, that's done. Think, think about the Wheeling Bridge project up there. 26 bridges we replaced with, with a single construction project because we had the resources finally, finally to do that. 26 bridges and seven miles of Interstate 70 up there in Wheeling. It cost over $200 million, $220 million, more than that. Those bridges were crumbling literally before our eyes. And we finally put the investment into them because we had the Roads to Prosperity program 
that provided the resources we needed to take care of what we needed to take care of. That's the same situation with, uh, with other bridges up there along the Ohio River. There's, uh, there's eight Ohio River bridge crossings up there. All eight of them need, need attention. There's no, no question about that. We're checking them. We're double-checking them. We're making progress with repairs as we move through because we finally have the resources to do that. But as we move forward in taking those repairs, it takes a little time to do that. It takes time to inspect a bridge. It takes time to analyze the data that those, those hard-working folks are out there every day putting their hands on every element of those bridges. It takes time to analyze that data and to make, to make assessments and good engineering judgments to make sure that we're making good, sound decisions. Those down, sound decisions also take a little time to try to get out to folks so that we can get to those. So what, we've, uh, what, what we're doing up there in the panhandle today is yesterday, just, just yesterday, I had my bridge program, inspection program manager in my office at 6 o'clock yesterday evening informing me of what he was seeing in the data. The report, the report was still pending at that point. He showed me enough to make the decision that we needed to, uh, to do something there. We considered trying to nurse that bridge along uh, and, and try to get through another month or so and keep that bridge open. And it's just not in the shape to where I'm comfortable with doing that. So we're going to close that bridge. The, that bridge is actually closed right now. We closed it about 1 o'clock today. So that, that bridge is closed. It's very fortunate. It's very fortunate because just south of there, just, uh, just about seven miles south of there, we have that wonderful new Wellsburg Bridge that we celebrated the opening on. So there's, there's an alternate there. We also have another bridge that's within sight of this bridge, just right there inside of the bridge you can see the Veterans Memorial Bridge, which is also an alternate route. So, uh, so we will be able to, to, to manage while we're working on, on, on seeing how, how this is going to go with the, with the Market Street Bridge there. But uh, the, the Market Street Bridge has a long history. Uh, I've been with highways a long time. About 13 years ago, we, we, we had issues with the Market Street Bridge. It's a cable stay bridge. Uh, that means it's, it's supported by strands of cable from towers. And uh, about 13 years ago, we did indeed have some issues there. 13 years ago, we didn't have a Roads to Prosperity program. We didn't have the resources to go in there and replace or rehab or repair that bridge. What we did do is we, we literally decided that we could do some minimal repairs in order to keep that bridge open at the time. And we knew that those, those repairs were temporary. We knew those repairs would, might get us through a decade. That's what we were kind of hoping for, a decade through, through, of use for that bridge. And apparently we were able to do that because it was about 13 years ago that we completed that. So we were able to do that. Today we're not in that position. Today that bridge has continued to deteriorate. Just about a year ago I had ordered that bridge to be uh, inspected on three-month intervals just so that we could monitor it. That's... Uh, that's the strength of our bridge program is we have the data at our fingertips. We, uh, we know exactly the conditions that those 7,000 bridges are in. So once we move to that three-month inspection cycle, that, uh, we started noticing trends. We were, in there, we were in there every three months putting our hands on those strands and watching for deterioration, and we, we saw that that bridge continued to deteriorate. About six months ago, I signed a commissioner's order that lowered the posting limit on that bridge to three tons and we uh, installed a barrier over the top to, to take trucks off the bridge and that's uh, that's exactly what we did and we were still able to let cars use the bridge safely because we knew exactly where we were with it. Uh, over the next two inspection cycles including the one we just finished yesterday about dark we, uh, we, we saw even with the trucks off that the bridge continued to deteriorate. The strands were continuing to deteriorate. All right. I made the decision that we would close the bridge and we began that process of communicating with our FHWA partners, communicating with, uh, with everyone to do that. As a matter of fact, we have uh, our District 6 uh, district manager will be in, in, out, out, out on the ground in Wheeling or in that area doing interviews this afternoon to answer questions for the local folks up there and we'll be, uh, we'll be moving it along. So, 
that's, uh, that's what I have for you. Listen to the local news up there, and you can get more details from uh, Charlie Reynolds, our District 6 manager, this afternoon. Once again, thank you, Governor, for uh, allowing me to come over and expand on this a little bit and maybe reach a few more people. But thank you, Governor. No, Jimmy, thank you, and thank you for all the great job you all do every day. I mean, for crying out loud, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, the West Virginia Water Devel Development Authority has approved another round of economic enhancement grants, you know, or grants, uh, you know, projects across the state. I want to read, read to, uh, I, I don't think I'll get them all, but I'm, I'm going to read to you the ones, the, the biggest projects that we have. But it's $26 million total dollars, but uh, there's an $8.5 million project going to happen at East Bank in Kanawha County to upgrade their sewer system and everything, including two new pumping stations. Uh, there's a $4 million uh, grant that's going to be given to the, the town of Sophia in Raleigh County, West Virginia, to construct a new sewer plant that will also serve the Coal City area. There's a $3.6 million grant that's going to be for Mercer County PSD to construct a regional sewer collection and treatment system in western Mercer County. There's a $3.5 million grant that's going to happen in North Beckley, the North Beckley PSD area in, in, or in, in Raleigh County to provide sewer service to approximately 218 new customers in the Piney View and Badoff Mountain area. You know, uh, and since, I'm gonna continue to read just this a little bit to you, but since April of 2022, the Water Development Authority has approved infrastructure and economic development projects worth over $330 million. You know, that's impacting, you know, you know, unbelievable amounts of West Virginians. And these projects have extended to, uh, you know, have, will, these pro projects will also extend water lines to over 6,300 new customers across 49 counties. It's a massive, massive uh, undertaking, but uh, so much good stuff has happened right here. More good stuff right here. The Jefferson County Courthouse has officially been designated as the 16th National Historic Landmark in West Virginia. It's the first time we've done, you know, we've had a, a National Historic Landmark designation since 2003. We congratulate them in every way and great, great, great stuff. The Mountaineer Challenge Academy has graduated another class of 101 cadets and everything. If you absolutely don't know much about the Mountaineer Challenge Academy, whether it be at Camp Dawson or south, you know, right, at, right, at, right up here in Montgomery, you should find out because it is amazing, amazing, you know, if you're able to be with those kids and see just how, how, how they're growing up. They're absolutely, a lot of those kids have, have got on a wrong path. And a lot of those kids now, I mean, all of them, in my opinion, are now having a life-changing event that is happening in their life. They're on their way in our workforce and everything and absolutely on their way to doing more and more and more goodness across this state. I salute our National Guard and all the great work that they do and have done and uh, please continue to do it. Graduated in another class, great stuff. Okay, you know I love, I love fishing and hunting and here's another state record. Another blue catfish has, has been caught by Michael John Drake of St. Albans and, and, and he just caught this incredible fish that weighed 69.45 pounds. That's, uh, that's really beginning to push about, well, it's 15% it's, it's bigger than baby dog. And I can't imagine, you know, that and everything. A lot, of, a lot of the troopers, and I know for myself, baby dog's a handful, but a 69.45 pound fish is something else. And it, and it measured in length uh, 50.51 inches. And so to Michael John Drake, congratulations. And gosh, what a fish. What a fish. Makes me leery about going in the water, to tell you the truth. But uh, great job, great job. Nearly 100 turkeys were harvested in our fall turkey season and everything. 
I can remember like it was yesterday that I'd never seen a wild turkey. Nobody had been in the woods more than me. But in 1976, I think, is the first wild turkey that I ever saw in West Virginia. Now think about that. I grouse hunted all the time. I never saw a wild turkey in the state of West Virginia until 1976. Actually, the first wild turkey that I ever saw in West Virginia, I was able to harvest it in the spring turkey season. Now think about that. Today, they flourish all across our state. How did it happen? It happened by a lot of great people that were trapping and transporting and moving turkeys around and everything else, and lo and behold, they're all over our great state, and many of us have the opportunity to enjoy being out in the woods. I tell you over and over, great work, DNR. Great work. Keep doing the great work, and thank you so much for all of us that enjoy the outdoors, and I tell everybody, get out there. Right here's a great opportunity to start getting out there. You can buy your, your 2024 hunting, trapping, and fishing licenses. They're on sale now. I've told you about this before. An incredible gift would be to give some, uh, a, you know, a lifetime hunting and fishing license, you know, to either a youngster or somebody that you know that really enjoys and everything. It's a great Christmas present. Think about it. Just think about it. Okay, the big buck photo stuff. I'm reminding all hunters to submit their photos and everything. I've already told, told you about this. There's some significant prizes there. Please do so. Okay, you know, game time announcements and everything. Marshall probably didn't end the season the way they wanted to, but they got to a bowl. Coach Huff and everything, I know they've done a great job. They're going to continue to do that and everything. We're really proud of them. The West Virginia women's basketball you know, team has started off the season. They're 10-0. That's pretty daggum impressive. You know, you can't win them all if you don't win the first 10. And so, uh, so they're doing really great. And we, we congratulate all of them. You know, his first year coach, and I think it's Mark Kellogg. And, and, uh, but, uh, but Mark, keep up the great work and everything. I know you're excited. And I know all those beautiful young ladies are as well. So keep it going. You know, uh, 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 we have uh, w one of our coaches has been named the coach of the year in this country, and that is Mark Stafford. And uh, but uh, but he is our he, he he was our men's soccer you know head coach and everything. And uh, but we have a coach of the year in Mark and and and, and, and you know I, I or, or I'm sorry Dan Stafford and, and and but Dan keep up the great work. Uh, you know what an award. I mean, you know, that, that's really something. Big, big, big time. You know, the National Coach of the Year. Okay, uh, you know, I, I guess this is my last thing, and I want to absolutely just talk to you just one second about this. You know, it's Christmas. It's Christmas right upon us. Uh, there's lots of folks out there that are probably really hurting. And if you know any of those folks, I'd ask you please to reach out to them. You know, let them know that you care. But uh, I ask you to join me in prayer about this time of year. A blessing absolutely beyond belief. The birth of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is not a pile of packages. Christmas is the birth of our Savior. And absolutely, it is the most precious of all. So with all that being said, again, I ask you to reach out. Reach out a hand that exemplifies God him, himself and all the blessings that he's given each and every one of us. Just think about just this. Think about how these families are the, of the two troopers. Think about the young, young trooper that's lost part of his leg. Think about absolutely so many across our state that are still hungry. Think about, you know, our service men and women that are deployed and, and families, families don't know that a call may be coming and everything that would be really, really, really tough. So absolutely in all that we celebrate. We celebrate our faith and we celebrate a time of year that is precious to all. 
I ask that you'll absolutely take time to be in prayer. Take time to be with your family. Take time to really, really be thankful and take time to reach out to those that are really hurting. So with all that being said, I pray with all in me for all West Virginians and all across this world, but especially all West Virginians, because I truly believe you're the greatest. God bless each and every one of you. And a happy and merry, merry, merry Thanksgiving, or <laughs> Christmas rather. You know, what a time. What a time of year. And, and I don't know how it could ever, ever, ever be any better. Merry Christmas, West Virginia. Thank you so very, very much. God bless. All right, thank you, Governor. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Paul Janimore with WTOV. Thank you, Governor uh, and uh, Commissioner Riston. I hope if, if he's still there, they need to answer this one. You know, we're, we're glad that you guys are catching these bridges before we end up with the Silver Bridge repeated up here uh, in the northern panhandle again. Uh, but, you know, we've had, uh, there's kind of a lack of communication. We've had a couple of years worth of work on the Veterans Memorial Bridge, for instance, which is now expected to shoulder all the burden. I'd be hard pressed to tell you exactly what all has been done to that bridge uh, in spite of the mazes of barrels. You know, we shut down the Randolph Bridge on December 11th. We didn't hear a full press release from the DOH for a couple of days. And we're just now, uh, you know, Charlie Reynolds is coming out to talk to us about it. So that's been, you know, since December 11th. And then uh, we, we lose the Market Street Bridge today. And again, understand that, you know, you guys got to do these things. But are we getting enough word to the public in any way that, that they can use to reassure them that there is some safety uh, if these bridges are reopened or not reopened or why. We're just not hearing a lot. Well, Paul, I think the very best person to answer all this is Jimmy. And, and so, Jimmy, please, uh, please, if you would, jump in. Is Jimmy still with us? Uh, yeah, yes, thank you, Governor. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. The, uh, the process of bridge inspections is serious, serious business. And, uh, and we take it very, very seriously. You, you mentioned the Silver Bridge, never again, never again. That, that, that's our pledge, that's our pledge to the public. The communication part, you know, always, we can do a better job in communicating, always, always. But first and foremost, our priority is to make sure that we're doing the technical part of the job, we're doing the inspection part of the job, and we're safeguarding the public. And we, we can always, catch you up and fill you in as fast as we can and that that's what we intend to do uh, we, we have folks there you know a lot of times you uh, a lot of times the media wants to go to the to a, to a different level to, uh, to to get to the to the story our, our, our county structures is not the place to go get technical information our county folks they're, they're the guys that are managing logistics they're the guys that are taking care of the secondary roads and the core maintenance plans the, the district level folks are managing those different district level programs, you know, the bridge inspectors work out of the districts. But we have, uh, we have program managers in central office and we try to work those, to get that information out to you guys through our PR folks. And, and we do that as best we can. But when we have, uh, when we're getting reports from the field and we're evaluating those things and we're looking at pictures and we're looking at data, it takes a little time for us to make sure that we're making right decisions. These, this is serious decisions that we're making. So we want to get them right. And I, the worst thing I could ever do is to give you wrong information. So I'll take a little more time to get you correct information before I ever give you wrong information. And uh, I, I would ask that you bear with us just a little bit. And, and any time you have questions, you contact our PR folks. And we'll get, we'll get to you. We, we always get back to you. Maybe we'll miss one news cycle deadline, but, uh, but we'll get you the information as fast as we can. Charlie will be up there to fill in on the details. You know, Char Charlie's doing a great job up there. He's, uh, he's going to make, make some rounds up there and talk to folks. He's going to talk to some of the local leaders, and he's going to talk to the media up there. And we can, we can fill you in on the details of those. The, the Jennings-Randolph Bridge is, uh, you know, we're, we're still working that issue, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Okay, our next question, please. All right, thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Curtis Johnson with WSAZ. 
Hey, good afternoon, Governor, and Merry Christmas to you as well. Um, I want to ask you about sports matter. I know you're a high school basketball coach and you love the sports. Um, as coach, what's your thoughts on WVSSAC's reclassification, moving to four classes, uh, uh, quad A, triple A, double A, single A? And in a state that's losing population, is a, in a state that's losing population, is a quad A class necessary? Well, Curtis, you know, I, I'm, I'm just hearing about it as you're hearing about it and everything. And uh, so I really don't, I don't know that I have a, you know, a, a real learned opinion, you know, opinion, but I can tell you just this, that uh, I think from the standpoint of Greenbrier East and where I've coached, you know, I, I, you know, I think Greenbrier East basketball is going to drop down to 3A. Uh, I don't like that, you know, and, uh, but I can, I, I can tell you just this, uh, you know, from the standpoint of your question about it as a state, it's losing population. Well, we don't want to be losing population for sure, and we're working that in every way, and maybe the gains aren't really significant, but there are gains, and, uh, and so, so, you know, but, but here, there, there's a deeper rooted problem that I see 101, you know, deeper rooted, and that's just this is, uh, you know, we have got to clean up. I mean, when, when our legislature comes back in, we've got to clean up what we already did in regard to uh, all this transfer stuff and all the stuff that people do, you know, we're, you know, here's a perfect, perfect example. I mean, you know, right now, from what I can see, in the Kanawha Valley, you know, from a standpoint of girls basketball, I can tell you that we're, we're very, very, very quickly, you know, having a situation to where the parity's gone, kids aren't coming out. You know, when kids see, you know, teams get beat you know, in football, 96 to three and stuff like that. To be perfectly honest, it takes a real commitment for a kid to play sports. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you spin around two or three times and people aren't even coming out enough to be able to field a team. You know, tonight, Greenbrier East is playing at South Charleston, South Charleston, South Charleston doesn't have a JV team. You know, it is, it is sad in lots of ways. And we gotta clean this up because Really and truly, our high school sports are really, really important. And uh, I couldn't get anybody to hardly listen to me. But before you know it, if we don't watch out, and like I would, in my terminology, would use spin around three or four different times, we're going to have absolutely a situation in the state of West Virginia where we've lost, lost our sports and lost a lot of stuff that are so, so, so important to kids and, uh, and, and their future in many ways. And so, with all that being said, you know, Curtis, I don't know. I, you know, I, I really don't really have, like I said, a learned opinion, you know, on, on whether, you know, going to a quad A is, is, is the proper move. But uh, I entrust, you know, in the SSAC that, that they've got this figured out. And, uh, and but at the same time, uh, crying out loud, I'm, I'm, I'm way more concerned about the fact that, uh, you know, the Capital Girls team, from what I understood, you know, had seven kids. South Charleston can't field a JV team. You know, I, I think, you know, when it really boils right down to it, St. Albans is having trouble. You know, Riverside, we just played Riverside and they're really struggling. You know, I mean, it's just uh, absolutely, you, you, you've got, people have got to listen to me, but, but you know, when, when kids, just remember just one thought, and that's just this. Kids have to go to school the next day. And you go get beat 96 to 3. What do you think the kids at the school, your friends, your not so close friends and everything, they're humiliating those kids. And very, very, very quickly, kids decide, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be part of that at all. And then you can't even field a team, you know. 
we cannot destroy high school sports in West Virginia. We can't do it. We just can't do it. And uh, we got to fix this. But uh, Curtis, I don't think that answered your question, but, but that's how I feel about sports in general. All right, thanks, Curtis. Next, we'll go to Randy Yoey with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Thanks a lot. Uh, Merry Christmas, uh, Governor and colleagues. One of my hearing aids broke this morning, so I'm a little bit at a loss, but I am going to visit in-laws for Christmas, so maybe it's not so bad. Um, my question, newly released census data shows that West Virginia added 4,700 residents last fiscal year, but 8,600 more people in West Virginia died than were born leaving the state with a net population loss of about 4,000. So the economic implications there seem to be that the state has an unhealthy aging population, and these people put a lot more economic pressure on publicly provided services than do healthy young people. So, Governor, how and where might this information affect state agency decision-making policies? Well, Randy, let me just say just this. You know, there was a time was without any question there was a time when I would have if I had been your governor at that time you know I would have been really concerned right now because of the diversifying uh, or you know or, or having a diversity of, of, of our economy the the fact that that we have we have now pulled ourselves out of an ungodly uh, economic hole. We have absolutely, we have business opportunity now in, in at, at every, at, you know, at every street corner almost. You know, there are surpluses beyond belief. And with all that being, you know, said, today my concern is very, very minimal. You know, there's no question West Virginia is, I think, the third oldest state in the country and the state with the most chronic illnesses in the country. With all that being said, you know, people are going to die in West Virginia. I'm tickled to death that 4,700 4, people have moved into West Virginia, and I want it to be 47,000, and then I want it to be 470,000. You know, but with all that being said, uh, I, I want to try to protect the folks that are in West Virginia, the, the aging folks, and, and we're going to continue to try to accomplish that in every way. We're going to do everything in our power to make life better and better and better for those folks and everything, and we've done so. I mean, you really and truly don't have to even, even think twice about it. You know, from the standpoint of what we've already done, I go back to judge me by my deeds, and we've done it, and we're going to continue to do it. So, so uh, while I'm not overly concerned about the ability to be able to do it you see that's what i was what i was saying is before when you're dead flat broke back double triple i mean you couldn't even begin to do to provide the services that we needed to provide in every way so now we can do it so i'd say not only are we doing it but we got to continue to do and even do better All right, thanks, Randy. Next, we'll go to Mark Curtis with Next Star Media. Good afternoon, Governor. Merry Christmas to you and Kathy and your kids and grandkids and um, everybody at the Capitol and my fellow reporters. Uh, Governor, this is kind of a long question, but I've got to set it up, and, and I would like you to comment on it, and I would like Jimmy Riston to weigh in as well. Yesterday, we had four fatalities on Corridor G between Kanawha, Boone, and Lincoln counties in three separate accidents. A couple of months ago, we had a fatal accident on Corridor G involving a South Charleston fire truck. Uh, this takes me back to our dear late friend, Eddie Belcher, who was a maintenance man at the Capitol, but who also was a community activist and uh, led the petition drive to get 4,000 people to sign signatures to get traffic lights installed in Alum Creek at Bruneland Road in Corridor G, where there had been six or seven fatalities in a very short order of time. Um, it's very dangerous out there, and I'm wondering, uh, given all of this information, um, is it time to commission a DOH study of the high speeding conditions out there without traffic lights for long stretches? People go 80 miles an hour plus, especially big trucks. 
And um, it, will you check, see if there's a need for more traffic enforcement from the state police, as well as more traffic lights? And, and what will you both do to address this, this matter? Well, Mark, f first of all, I think Jimmy's got to speak way more about this than myself. But I will say just this, you know, uh, it's winter time. That's all there is to it. And it's winter time in West Virginia. And you've got black ice and, you know, that can form at temperatures above freezing. And uh, especially if you've got some level of wind. And so with all that being said, we better realize and realize real quickly that, that winter time in West Virginia, we better slow down. We absolutely better, you know, watch in every way. I hear what you're saying, Mark, and, I'll, and, and, and this is the first I've heard of it, and I absolutely want to, again, reiterate the fact that, uh, you know, if these were alcohol-related deaths, it's terrible, and at this time of year, you got a lot of parties going on, a lot of, a lot of that going on and everything. you got to be careful there, too, but, but with all that being said, Mark, you know, I, I trust in, in, in you. I, I have a lot of confidence that you absolutely uh, come with the goods and everything in the right way. You don't come in a way other than the fact that you want things to be better. That's all there is to it, and I do too. And so let's hear from Jimmy, and then let's try to do anything we possibly can to try to make things better, save a life, whatever. So Jimmy, come on, t talk to us. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mark, thank you for your question. Mark, Mark, this, this really touches, this, this one hits home for me, the safety on these highways, uh, not just in the work zones, but safety for the operators on the highway as well. But we are taking this very seriously, very seriously. We're committed to getting to that zero. We, we, we cannot just, just have this be a, a mantra. We can't have this be a slogan. We've got to make a commitment to it, and that's what we've been doing. We've been working on this all year long. We have been working with our AASHTO partners across all 52 DO, state DOTs. We have, uh, w just, just two months ago, I sent a delegation from our traffic division to a safety summit that AASHTO sponsored. We, uh, at that meeting, Shailen Bott, the director of the FHWA, committed to us that, that we would have funding for safety on, on, our, on our highways. So if, if those federal funds is, becomes a reality, then we can implement a lot of the plans. But, Mark, and I know you do your homework. You know that most of those accidents out there, they don't have anything to do with safety elements on the roadway. It's simple speeding. It's distracted driving. We have got to find ways to change the culture of the drivers on the highway. We've got to be able to impact and change the way they look at operating a motor vehicle and, and affect that behavior positively and those, those that that's one of the big focuses that the West Virginia approach is taking this is uh, this is what what, what the Ashto states are coalitioning around this is what the our FHWA partners are, are bringing to the table yes there's a lot of things we can do to engineer and, and make the roadways as safe as we possibly can there's a lot of elements uh, highway runoffs uh, was was a big issue just a couple of years ago and we, we came up with a, a safety edge on the roadways when, when we construct them that, that helps prevent those, those turnovers and those off, off, uh, highway runoff road accidents that cause fatalities. You've seen, uh, you've seen more roundabouts. You've seen our cuts in places in, uh, around the state. These are things that help. It doesn't prevent accidents when you have, design, uh, you know, when you have uh, accidents or you have incidences on the road. I, I hate to even call them accidents. They're crashes. But uh, what it does is it eliminates the... the it, 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 makes it more possible to survive those crashes and that's uh we're going to do everything we can i have a task force within the division of department of transportation we have uh, we have our state police partners on that on that task force we have uh, the trucking industry we have our safety folks we have our fhwa partners we've come up we, we've come up with with uh, a pretty good framework for a plan a plan that we can execute to start moving ourselves, moving that needle to zero fatalities on our highways. we got to commit to it. It can't be a slogan. It can't be a mantra. It, you know, we've got to commit to it. And that's going to take resources. That's going to take concerted effort. And it's going to take working on getting drivers to, to, to do the right thing when they're operating the vehicles on the road. All right. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll go to Charles Young with WV News. 
Hi, this is Charles Young with W News. Um, Governor, I wanted to know, is um, Delegate Capito being included in this press conference, giving him the platform to make this announcement? Should we interpret that as some kind of endorsement? Um, and then second of all, have you given any thought to who will fill his house seat? Thank you, sir. I, I have not given any thought on, on who's going to you know, fill his house seat. And Charles, you should not, you should not uh, interpret this as, uh, as anything to do with an endorsement for more capito. Uh, from the standpoint, uh, you know, I was asked, you know, that, that more, you know, more, more is a very honorable, good, good, good man. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased we've got multiple candidates and everything. And, uh, but, and, and I'll make a decision as we go forward and everything if I want to get involved. But, uh, but, you know, from the standpoint, you should not interpret this as any way other than the fact that, that uh, more, more contacted us. You know, I, I found out about it last night and everything that Moore wanted to come in and hand deliver or, or you, know, ha you know, give us his, uh, his resignation. You know, he's, he's been our judiciary chair in the house for, you know, eight years now and, uh, and he's done a, a heck of a nice job and, uh, and he's a, a, a great young man and an incredible family. Uh, you know, you think about, you know, Senator Capito, you think about Moore's granddad and everything, you know, one of our ex-governors and everything that was really close really, really close to my family. And, uh, and so, so uh, you know, that's that you, you ought to interpret it as, as just, as just what Moore said, you know, that, uh, you know, and, and nothing any, any further than that. All right. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Well, let me see. Let me see real quickly here and everything. Well, I, I really don't, I really don't need to go any further than these troopers again, except for, uh, you know, Larry Faircloth, Faircloth and everything uh, that we lost and his, his family, and we're going to be lowering our flags and everything in his honor. And, uh, and uh, you know, we surely appreciate his service in every way. Uh, I, I'm going to come back to the troopers in just a second. I just want to make sure that I'm not forgetting something. I, again, congratulate, you know, Jefferson County Courthouse and everything. All the good stuff that's happening there. Uh, if I could do two things, and I could just say just this. You know, I've said it over and over, but every day we awaken. When it's 2 o'clock in the morning, no matter of the mistakes maybe that they may, that they may make from time to time, and there are very, very few. But no matter what the situation may be, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's something bad going on either in your backyard or maybe in a room in your house or whatever it may be. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Who do you call? You're going to call the state police. You're going to call some law enforcement officer and everything, and they're going to come running. They're going to come running to you in every way to try to help. Don't ever forget that. Please, 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 as far as Trooper Spessor or Trooper Bean, please remember them in your prayers and their family, at this time of year especially. And, and, I, and the last thing that I'll say today is just this. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas, West Virginia. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. And God bless you in every way. Don't ever forget just one thing. You're the best. You're the confounded best. That's all there is to it. Not, you know, you've known it, and I've known it for a long time. But the world didn't know it. And now the world's awakened. And now the world looks at you, West Virginia, as the place, the place that they want to come. We're all just on the very, very beginning of all kinds of greatness that's going to happen in the years to come. God bless each and every one of you for pulling the rope together and helping us get there. You're the best. That's all there is to it. You're low crime. You're faith-based. You're located within the sweetest spot in this country. You have four of the most unbelievable seasons. You're craftsmen. You're absolute family. You're neighbors. You're absolute loving and appreciative people. In every single way, you're the best. Don't ever forget it. Hold your heads high. 
I'm really proud of you. God bless each and every one of you. And Merry Christmas, West Virginia.